Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to today's seminar, which was long overdue because we had to schedule and reschedule it a few times. But finally, here, Jan is here, yeah, and Jan is going to speak to us about semi classical gravity goals test for physics. Over to you, Jan. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, apologies for the, the endless rescheduling. But my, my schedule is quite horrible, and uh, there were all kinds of other random factors that came in. Um, but here we are. <coughs> um, I gather that this is supposed to be a very informal seminar, so you know, please interrupt uh, anytime. Uh, the more questions, the better. Um, so in this in this uh, talk, I'd like to uh, explain some work I've been doing during the last two and a half years or so, maybe almost three years by now, uh, and. It's something I'm still working on and still have a bunch of projects on, and I'll say a few things about that uh, later in the talk. I also changed the title slightly to semi-classical gravity equals statistical physics, because this is uh, sort of the punchline of the talk. Um, <clears throat> so in some sense, this entire um, story started with asking a question. Um, which you could ask sharply within the context of ADS-CFT, but it might be interesting to uh, ask similar questions in other contexts as well, maybe cosmology or flat space, but I haven't given that a lot of thought yet. Uh, and the question is, in some sense, what is the dual, if you wish, what, what of the CFT, how much of the CFT on the boundary is actually captured if you only consider semi-classical gravity in ADS, so not the full non-perturbative string theory, which allegedly re recovers the full CFT for you, but only things that you can maybe measure as a low energy observer. Um, so suppose that all that you have is a semi-classical theory of gravity in ADS. What part of the CFT is captured by that semi-classical theory? And you might naively think, because semi-classical gravity is, is some sort of low energy effective field theory, that is going to be dual to a suitable low energy effective field theory approximation to the conformal field theory. What would be more obvious than saying that uh, low energy effective field theory in the bulk is the same as low energy effective field theory on the boundary? Um, but that's not quite how it works, because Gravity is just different from quantum field theory. Uh, and in particular, semi-classical gravity knows a bit more than the, just you know, applying low energy effective field theory to the boundary CFT. And some examples of things that the boundary theory knows about that normally um, would be unavailable in any low energy approximation is, for example, that just in the semi-classical gravitational theory in ADS, you can um, compute the partition function of the CFT at arbitrary temperature, including very high temperature. Because in ADS CFT, if you want to compute the partition function of the CFT at very high temperature, you, all you need to do in, in the bulk is you need to put a black hole in the bulk and compute the, sort of the partition function of that black hole or the energy of the black hole and the entropy of the black hole. Um, so just because you can put in semi-classical gravity, you can put a black hole in the bulk and you can make the black hole as large as you want without invalidating the semi-classical gravitational description. Uh, and you can compute the black hole entropy using just semi-classical gravitational methods. So you can find the density of states, the entropy of the black hole, or the density of states in the conformal field theory as a function of temperature for arbitrary high temperature. If all that we had was just low energy effective field theory in the CFD, then this information would not be available. So gravity knows more than just the low energy effective field theory approximation to the CFD. Gravity knows about the density of states at arbitrarily high temperatures and energies. You can also do all kinds of other computations in ADS CFT that allow you to access regimes of the CFT, which are well outside the validity of the low energy approximation to the CFT, using only the low energy approximation to the gravitational theory. 
for example, you can compute the partition function uh, on various Euclidean manifolds that could involve small cycles, large cycles, etc. And you can compute those all typically reliably using semi-classical gravitational methods. You can look at correlation functions uh, in the CFT at finite temperature, including high temperature correlation functions. And again, those are all reliably computable in ADS using semi-classical methods. And finally, you can also, uh, as recent work showed, you can just get the pH curve. Uh, if you don't know what it is, then uh, that's fine. We're not going to use it later. Um, the pH curve associated to black hole evaporation is also something you can reproduce using only semi-classical gravitational methods. Uh, and that, in some sense, is a, is a more precise piece of information than just semi-classical CFT physics. It really is the unitarity of a process where you have a lot of low energy data, you collapse it into high energies, and then it scatters back into low energies again. And the fact that you can show that that is a unitary process, or at least that you can show that a pure state goes into a pure state in this process using only semi-classical gravitational computations is, uh, is striking. And again, shows you that uh, you have more access to the CFT than you might have thought before. <clears throat> um, so it's... I still haven't answered the question, namely what part of the CFT is, is uh, covered by semi-classical gravity, but we'll get there. Um, this was just some things that are covered by semi-classical gravity. And moreover, semi-classical gravity also gives rise to some weirdness because in semi-classical gravitational theories, you can have wormhole solutions. Um, there's a long footnote to this statement with, you know, are these wormholes stable? When do they exist? Blah, blah. But in principle, there are wormhole solutions in semi-classical gravitational theories that have two different ADS boundaries. Um, and these are weird. These are Euclidean wormholes with two ADS boundaries, and they uh, naively give rise to correlations between different boundaries. However, in ADS CFT, uh, we always thought that associated to each boundary, there was a separate CFT living. Um, and if you take, for example, in this particular case, you can think of these two circles as finite temperature circles. And this wormhole would simply be contributing to the product of two partition functions, according to the ADS-CFT dictionary. Um, That's very weird. This would suggest that there are correlations between uh, two different Euclidean boundaries. Um, and in a standard, ADS CFT, that's not supposed to happen because you just have one Euclidean theory on one side, one Euclidean theory on the other side, and you're not supposed to have any correlation between the two at all. The way in which you can create correlations between different Euclidean theories is, for example, by introducing some parameter in the theories uh, and by integrating over that parameter. So, um, for example, suppose that this is just, uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, suppose that this is a finite temperature boundary and this is a finite temperature boundary. Then this wormhole uh, seems to give some contribution to the product of two partition functions. And it's like a connected contribution. Um, and one way to get such contributions is to introduce some parameter, say J in this theory, some parameter J in this theory, uh, and to integrate over that parameter. Because once you introduce a parameter and you integrate over it, then you automatically get correlations that come from integrating over the parameter that is common between the two theories. Um, so in this particular case, there would be correlations between the two boundaries that, that come from this disorder average, because in, uh, when you introduce disorder in a theory and you average over disorder, you do exactly the same thing. Uh, but in ADS-CFT, until recently, no one ever gave much thought to disorder averages in this, in this particular sense. Um, so this is a bit weird. So... One might think that the existence of these Euclidean wormholes is therefore evidence that one needs to average in ADS-CFT because otherwise we cannot explain these wormholes. 
Um, however, that seems to disagree with what we always thought to be true in AJCFT. And also, if you go back to the original uh, Maldesena derivation of AJCFT, there was never any need to average over anything. So it's very peculiar to have this uh, sort of situation. And this is something that's called the, uh, the factorization puzzle. Uh, and the factorization puzzle is simply the puzzle that whereas you might have thought that if you have disconnected boundaries, the partition function should factorize, the wormholes seem to uh, give things that do not factorize, and therefore this is a factorization puzzle. Now, a special case where you can answer these types of questions is JT gravity. So JT gravity is this theory whose action is something like uh, plus some boundary terms, but it's just a 2D theory where one couples uh, uh, a scalar field to the curvature in this way. Um, the scalar field simply puts the scalar curvature equal to the cosmological constant. Uh, and then there is some field equations for the scalar, but it's basically a topological theory. So it's a topological theory and it's a UV complete theory because it's a topological theory. Um, and this theory can be more or less exactly solved. You can write down all the solutions of the field equations, including different topologies. And this was all uh, nicely worked out in a beautiful paper by Sa, Stanford and Schenker. And in this case, one can show that this particular very simple sort of cartoon of AES-CFT is in fact dual to an averaged theory. Because to be more precise, this theory is dual to a matrix model. Where the matrix, this matrix is roughly the Hamiltonian of, of the quantum mechanical system. But because it's a matrix model, you average over different matrices. In other words, you average over different Hamiltonians. So this is very much an average theory. Uh, but how, this is a very atypical example, however, because this is a topological theory. And in this case, a topological theory is dual to a matrix model is maybe not surprising. Uh, this theory is UV complete, and that's all there is to it. You can exactly solve it. But there's a huge difference between having a UV complete topological theory and an actual theory with propagating gravitons, like general relativity in four dimensions. Because if you do computations in higher dimensions and your theory is not topological, uh, your theory is not renormalizable, and the only thing you can do is, is uh, do approximate computations in your low energy effective field theory. There's no computation that you can do in a low energy effective field theory that resolve exact UV information. It's always approximate. Jan, can I ask something about your previous slide actually? Yeah, sure. Is this? Uh, so we have seen such situations before actually uh, also, right? Because in principle, even if you have two, like two copies of the theories or many copies of the same theory, uh, the states can be entangled, although they are separate. And, uh, and there you would expect that there is some geometry that captures this. For example, like the thermophile double is dual to eternal. So what do you like to comment about those things? Uh, yeah, whether... that's an important difference between the Lorentzian and the Euclidean case. Um, in the Lorentzian case, we know that entanglement can create geometric connections. And then this, this could be the picture of an equal time slice of that Lorentzian geometry, where there's this Einstein-Rosen bridge that connects the two things. Uh, and there, the correlations are uh, not coming from this order average, but from entanglement. However, if you do a Euclidean computation and not a Lorentzian computation, then this interpretation is not available. Um, in, in a Euclidean computation, you just compute a partition function. There's a state in a Euclidean computation. You just compute a partition function. And if what you're computing is a partition function, there's no way to create correlations between copies of the theory because you're not uh, doing anything in a state. You could imagine maybe more complicated hybrid Lorentzian Euclidean computations where you would introduce some sort of entanglement, but I'm talking here about purely 100% Euclidean computations. Uh, and then there's no way to introduce anything like entanglement between the theories. You're just computing partition functions. 
just like if you compute the standard partition function in AGS CFT, you just, uh, you know, you put a boundary, you have a regular interior. The fact that the interior is regular, that, that is sort of the missing boundary conditions. And that's why typically there's a unique solution where you specify the boundary metric plus regularity. Whereas in Lorentzian signature, you always specify independently the normalizable and the non-normalizable mode, uh, where the normalizable mode gives you the state and the non-normalizable mode gives you some sources, right? Uh, but in Euclidean signature, we don't specify the normalizable and the non-normalizable mode independently. We just specify the sort of the non-normalizable mode. And then the normalizable mode, if you wish, is fixed by demanding regularity in the interior. And that's how you compute a partition function. There's no choice of state or anything like that in Euclidean signature. I see. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I mean, in principle, you could think about uh, uh, like putting certain, I don't know. I mean, this is just uh, uh, looking at a particular entanglement. Uh, uh, structure uh, and then looking at that particular con contribution to a thermal partition function some way. I don't know whether that makes sense, but in principle uh, that, you know, uh, I mean, okay, I, I heard this statements before that, uh, yeah, that's the Euclidean uh, force, it cannot have any, uh, it looks like more disorder, but is that only possible interpretation that you can have here? Or is there... Well, I think for, if you want to, uh do something in the towards what you were just saying then you likely need to uh, do something much more complicated where you first need to uh, create your state now you can make entangled states with euclidean path integrals with boundaries but but once you close um um I don't think there's any computation like that, that that gives you a fully Euclidean computation because all Euclidean computations at the end end up being partition functions. Hmm. I don't think there's any way in which you can make a purely Euclidean computation where you insert uh, state dependence. The only thing you can do is you can add operators to the theory and compute Euclidean correlators with operator insertions. Now you're free to cut it open and to interpret it as a sum over states of some sort, but um, there's no way to add on top of that entanglement between states. It's just an interpretation of the Euclidean computation. And if you want to restrict the sets of states that run in the loops, then you typically um, need to glue in a Lorentzian piece of geometry or do something other, more complicated than doing a purely Euclidean computation. Thanks. Um, and before, and if you if you wanted to actually uh, do something, you can try to do something like you said by adding all kinds of. But then I think all those other possibilities they end up secretly doing computations that are similar to this kind of expression here. Because if you want to correlate states that run in the loop on the left to states that run in the loop on the right, you need to detect those states with some operator on the left and on the right. You, you need to measure those expectation values, and then you need to correlate those expectation values to introduce a correlation or entanglement between the states on the left and the states on the right. And that presumably requires you to insert a suitable source in your theory that detects what states is running there. And then if you want to correlate them, you probably need to integrate over those sources and make them the same on the left and on the right, etc. So then you're I think you will eventually end up with a disorder average expression. I see. Yeah. So you're saying that you can entangle the sources on both sides. So, so like I think I think if you wanted to, I think these computations, if you if you do it in a particular way and you cut these computations open and you insert complete sets of states in traces and so on, you might be able to reinterpret those disorder averages as basically having to do with entanglement. But this wormhole solution already exists without any sources or anything. It exists without imposing any such correlation between the state on the left and on the right. And that's where the puzzle sits. The, the, if we 
um, were to ask questions in ADS-CFT, you know, uh, I'm writing some funny correlator with some correlations, there would be no puzzle that a wormhole contributes to that computation. Because these computations have correlations between left and right built in. The question, the, the puzzle arises that this geometry seems to just contribute to Z beta, Z beta, as it stands, without any sources, no correlations between the states, etc. And that, that's not supposed to happen. And that's that's the factorization puzzle. So it's bit, the simplest case is to just have boundaries, no sources, nothing, just some boundaries with finite temperature, and that's all you put on the boundary. Did that clarify, uh, or, or yes, do you? Yes, sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah. So as I was saying, in in higher dimensional gravitational theories, there's typically no computations that give you precise UV information. There are a few exceptions that have to do with supersymmetry and localization or with protected quantities and so on, but I, I won't be talking about any of that. I'm, I'm just imagining non-protected standard scattering amplitudes and so on in the theory. Um, and it's important that any low energy computation you do in the gravitational theory, it gives you some new information about the UV physics, just like this large black hole that we could put in ADS. Um, gives us an answer for the high temperature partition function of the theory. Um, but it's only an approximate answer for the high temperature partition function. You don't get the exact high temperature partition function, only an approximate one. And the approximation that you always make in any gravitational theory is that you get so-called coarse grained UV information. Um, that word coarse graining it's maybe a bit murky, so maybe it's good to illustrate it with like a stupid example. Um, for example, if you go back to this black hole example, so you put a black hole in ADS and you compute this partition function using semi-classical uh, gravity. Um, that is this thing here. This is approximate. This is what you compute approximately using Euclidean ADS CFD. Then you can extract from that an with the answer for rho of e, the density of states, because the partition function and the density of states are related by, uh, by this standard equation here. So given the partition function that you obtain from gravity, you obtain a density of states rho of e, which is approximate. And it's typically, it's a smooth function, right? Uh, typically you get like e rho and e, and it's something that grows like crazy when e increases, but it's a smooth function if you do this computation. Um, the, the exact density of states in ADS TFD is supposed to be a sum of delta functions, like so. Because there's discrete energy levels, and therefore the density of states is that. But this is not something you ever see if you that you ever see directly in a gravitational computation, because this would mean that you could read off the exact spectrum of the theory. Uh, and that's a very complicated question. Obviously, it's a strongly coupled gauge theory on the boundary, and uh, it's very difficult to compute its spectrum at large. And uh, and this this is not happening. So rather than seeing all those delta functions, what you see is some coarse grained version of all those delta functions, and that's the smooth curve here. So that's kind of what's meant by coarse graining. Uh, so you could take the sum over delta functions, and you could say integrate it against a a narrow Gaussian or something, and that would smear out all those delta functions, and that would produce a curve which is more in line with this. So the gravitational computation gives us UV information, it gives us high energy information, but it only gives us coarse grained high energy information. It gives us a smoothed out version of this density of state. Now, it's a bit subtle that, uh, so in JT gravity, the example I just mentioned, one found an average over theories, which is like a matrix model. Um, in higher dimensions, you always obtain coarse-grained answers 
from your low energy gravitational computations. But those two concepts are quite similar to each other. In some sense, if you take a theory and you perturb the theory slightly and you average over those perturbations, technically it's almost the same as taking the spectrum, wiggling the spectrum around a little bit and averaging over those wiggles. In both cases, you will end up with uh, what appears to be a smooth density of states rather than a discrete density of states. Uh, and some detailed information is gone. So technically, technically, coarse graining and averaging are very similar to each other. Both erase detailed information about the theory. Um, so you may wonder whether maybe this coarse graining, which, which is inherent to the low energy effective field theory of gravity, whether that coarse graining is somehow imitating averaging and that, that is the thing that explains the appearance of wormholes in semi-classical gravity. So Jan, I have a question here. Yeah. So there is a, when, you, when we define something like the fine-grained entropy, we usually say that uh, you consider a density matrix which reproduces the low energy observables of the actual density matrix. And then you take the one which has maximum entropy and you say that's a sort of the, not, not so, no, you said that's, that's a coarse grain entropy or uh, of the system. Uh, so uh, do you mean something similar here? Like it reproduces some, some specific things and, uh, and then we look at, uh, uh, look at the, uh, look at the, uh, the uh, look at, I mean, there's something similar that is in mind uh, that when you mean by coarse training here? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll come back to that later because that's precisely the sort of thing that uh, this coarse graining is supposed to be doing here. Um, so it's literally trying to take sort of your, your low energy and the information that's available is something that you take. And then you try to build a microscopic model that has maximum entropy in a suitable sense that's compatible with the information that's available. And, and uh, that thing is the coarse grained uh, model of, of the theory. That's correct. Yeah, I'll come back to that in a, in a couple of slides. Thank you. Uh, Jan, can I ask that a couple of questions? Sure. Uh, okay, so just going back to the previous slide where you have the exact uh, density of states and you have a semi-classical thing. So there are there is this so-called so Gutzwiller trace formula which says that we should be, if we sum over all the periodic orbits, we should get, you'll get, it'll be a sum of smooth functions and in the limit you will get, you will recover the this kind of uh, uh, discrete thing. Another example which I know is, you know, in terms of uh, like Hadi Ramanujan sort of thing again, which you can reinterpret in the entropy function story, where you sum over the various saddles and then you get put them together and you get actually you can recover the exact time. So, do you have any comments? Yeah, that's that's those are both very interesting examples where we understand kind of technically how to go from. Uh, sort of the continuous answer uh, th that's here, how to go to the exact answer. Yes. Um, so those are two examples. So the, like this Gutzwiller trace formula is, is very suggestive that perhaps something similar might be going on here and that if we would, you know, add all those extra ingredients somehow to our semi-classical approximation, we might be able to get the exact uh, density of states out of it. Um, yeah, that's what my question is. Can do you think we can in some sense? Yeah, um, I'll say something about that later. I'm not quite sure that that will work because this would require us to. Well, first of all, I'm a bit confused what the precise uh, statement would be. Um, I suppose if you if you would take uh, uh, a quant well, I thought th that these these kinds of states must typically apply in relatively simple systems, but let's assume. Yeah, it yeah it's 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 in quantum mechanical systems, not quantum field theory. But uh, the other example is like half BPS black holes in say in n equal to four string theory. There we it's really sum over saddles actually gives the answer. Yeah, th that's correct. So, um, but um, that's supersymmetric. So. 
that's super symmetric and um, that might that might be that might not be how it works in the non super symmetric case because for example in the super symmetric case um, the spacing in the spectrum is is integers roughly because of uh, the bps condition or it's at least it's in a small unit but it's not exponentially small the level spacing uh, because typically the energy is proportional to a linear combination of charges. The charges are quantized, so the energy comes in discrete bins. And that's very different from when you're like in the middle of the theory, where the theory is believed to be chaotic and the density of states is believed to be E minus S. Uh, so it's very different from the exact state counting uh, computations. Whether this trace, this goods will a trace formula, um, can be applied is unclear. I think it's a great question. Um, for that one, we need to understand the exact periodic orbits of the theory, which might be very challenging. Because that is not information that's a priori available in semi-classical gravity per se, um, because that's an approximation to the theory. And in particular, the phase space and the classical equations of motion of the gravitational theory uh, are not exact solutions necessarily of the full UV complete theory, nor is it all periodic solutions of the full UV complete theory. Um, so one would need to extend the theory considerably in order to have any hope of finding the uh, all the periodic orbits of sort of the, uh, the UV complete theory, the classical UV complete theory. Uh, I don't know if that's possible or not. Uh, and it's it's true, it's only in quantum mechanics, but maybe if you're in finite volume, maybe the theory is kind of quantum mechanical in nature, so maybe that's not too much of a problem. But uh, it's probably very problematic to uh, claim that you found the... I, yeah, I think it's quite problematic to claim that one knows all periodic orbits of the full UV complete theory, and that's probably where it becomes a bit problematic. Um, we'll come back to this point in, in, in some way a bit later, but uh, is, this, is this okay for an hour? Uh, thank you. Yeah, really good. Jan, could I ask for a small clarification? Sure. Yeah, so uh, this, this formula here that uh, you have, uh, you're talking about coarse graining in terms of binning in energy or in terms of the parameters of the dual theory? In this particular case, you can interpret it in terms of binning of the uh, of the energies, and that's equivalent to uh, averaging over parameters of the theory. Is that what you want to? No, no, no. This uh, is uh, um, no, because I don't. At the end, I do not want to advocate some sort of averaging perspective. The only reason I'm I'm I um, mentioned averaging is because that's what happens in this very atypical example of a topological theory, namely JT gravity there. So, so this is not like JT, this is really averaging with energy. You don't, this is, yeah, you this don't is want to show that. Yeah. yeah, this is just averaging energies. For example, in a 2D CFT, we have the Cardi formula. Uh, it, the Cardi formula is precisely this feature. It's a continuous function of energy, but we know that in an actual 2D CFT, it's supposed to be a sum of delta functions. Right, right. Thanks. Uh, uh, just and, yeah. No, no, please finish. No, I, I, you can go ahead. I was kind of finished. Uh, I was just commenting that the initially, the motivation that you gave that in the bulk, you have a low energy effective field theory. So one should expect a low energy effective conformal field theory, but that's not in the spirit of ads -CFT, right? Because of the uh, duality of the scales of the two theories. So it's not really a surprise that we don't get the low energy effective version of the boundary theory from low energy gravity. Just a uh, comment. Th that's kind of correct, although it's true that uh, the light fields of the bulk theory correspond to the low lying operators of the boundary theory. Mm -hmm. um, so you would have thought that the, uh, the only thing that you can compute using the, the low energy bulk theory is correlation functions of simple light operators in the boundary theory, which is kind of part of the low energy effective field theory sector of the boundary theory, you could argue. 
or maybe we should say low conformal dimension sector of the boundary theory. So it's it, it is kind of a low energy, low energy duality. Although, yeah, there's UVIR duality um, in the book. Uh, but as far as correlation functions and so go, I think uh, you could argue you is low energies that map to low energies essentially thanks yes thanks um cool moving on yeah so it's an interesting question whether uh, uh coarse graining can somehow imitate averaging and whether somehow it's coarse graining that is fundamentally responsible, and this relates to Ion's question, uh, somehow fundamentally responsible for the appearance of wormholes. This will be one of the important points that I want to make. Um, let's first see how in, in a very simple cartoon setting, so this is just, this is not a realistic model of any sort, it's just a simple cartoon. Suppose you take N random faces, we're not doing statistics here. We just take and random, we just sample a very large number of random faces from a random distribution, from a uniform distribution on the circle. So we have a particular list of faces. Now, if you were to look at the sum of e to the i phi i, this is just some erratic sum of faces. And if you coarse grain an erratic sum of faces, it would be equal to zero. There's no reasonable answer you can associate to it. It's just, it's just a bunch of erratic numbers. They average to zero. Um, and you can multiply it by its complex conjugate, which is also erratic. And that by itself is also not something that you see in gravity because it, it's roughly zero. Um, however, if you multiply these things together, then on the right hand side, you get the um, you get these diagonal terms here. Um, these don't cancel each other. That's that's a term that's the diagonal, and that's equal to n or e to the s in this language. So that is something that maybe you know does not go away if you average your coarse grain. That remains. Whereas the off-diagonal terms, uh, they're very erratic and they're invisible in in gravity, and they might maybe you know coarse grain to zero. So if coarse graining is something where if you have sums of basically wildly oscillating random faces, they get coarse grain to zero, then we can you know, get this apparent contradiction where zero in the low energy theory times zero in the low energy theory is equal to N in the low energy theory plus zero in the low energy theory. And that seems very wrong, but it's a mistake that you make if you coarse grain every individual term in the equation in the way that I just described. And perhaps the type of coarse graining that low energy gravity is doing is very similar to this. So then the, uh, and, and this is precisely an example where we have the product of two numbers. Those things have no correlations whatsoever. It's just the product of two numbers. Just like uh, you could take the product of two partition functions in AGS CFT. This is just the product of two numbers. And it's, it's uh, and this looks like it's extracting some correlations between those two things. But it's fake, right? The left hand side is just the product of two numbers, and there are no correlations between them. But if you multiply this structure together and you, and you, uh, oh, sorry coarse grain the whole thing in a particular way. And on the right-hand side, there's the sum over one, these diagonals, there's these off-diagonal terms. So if this were to be interpreted as a wormhole, um, everything would be fine. And we would indeed get an apparent contradiction, but the apparent contradiction would be the result of our coarse graining procedure. Because we would coarse grain this to zero, we would coarse grain this to zero, we would coarse grain this to zero, and we would not coarse grain this to zero. And if that's our coarse graining procedure, we are led to apparent contradictions that are due to the coarse graining procedure, not to the fact that there's any averaging going on. Uh, and this is maybe 
a bit of a cartoon model for what is happening in the gravitational theory. If you, if you take a low energy gravitational theory, we make some approximation to the full UV physics. In particular, it includes some coarse graining. We're still a bit vague about exactly what that coarse graining is, but it involves some sort of coarse graining. Uh, and as a result of that coarse graining, we make apparent mistakes in low energy computations of the type zero times zero equals n plus zero in this simple example. I think in some sense, these things here are a bit like these Goodswiller, uh, you know, this Goodswiller trace formula. These are a bit like uh, these other periodic orbits. And if you would add these all in, then indeed factorization would be restored. Um, now coming back to, yeah, what happens in the full UV theory? So there are several possibilities here. Uh, that, suppose that this is the right cartoon of what a low energy theory of gravity is doing. It's doing some coarse graining, which leads to apparent mistakes. And those apparent mistakes uh, are due to the coarse graining procedure that low energy gravity somehow applies to the full UV theory. And suppose indeed that this is sort of a cartoon model for a wormhole, hence the little picture on top. Now, what happens in the full UV theory? So the full UV answer is this equation here, which is an obviously a true equation. Now, what happens in the UV theory? One possibility is that this solution, this, this semi-classical saddle point simply does not exist in the UV theory anymore. It gets destabilized, it should not be included. If it's gone, then in principle, uh, there is no connected saddle anymore in your theory. Therefore, uh, the theory may well be, although there's still an off-shell configuration like that, um, there certainly is no saddle point like that anymore. Uh, and therefore, factorization may well be restored. It's quite possible that this happens. We know mechanisms by which wormholes get destabilized in the UV theory. And the simplest example of a destabilization mechanism of a wormhole in the UV theory uh, is a bit like Swinger pair production. Uh, because suppose um, if you have like a constant electric field, um, we know that uh, by pair production, by Swinger pair production, uh, we get uh, uh, electron positron pairs and they will be created in such a way to sort of break up the electric field. Similarly, most wormholes in ADS-CFT will be supported by fluxes and at sufficiently high energies, we will discover that the theory contains non-perturbative objects called D-brains. Those are very heavy. They're not naively part of the low energy effective field theory, but they do exist. Um, and by uh, like an analog of swing pair production, one uh, can imagine that given a wormhole that's supported by fluxes that typically brain anti brain pairs will nucleate and that those will tend to destabilize the wormhole. There might even be a general swampland like argument related to these uh, things like the cobordism conjecture and so on that this must happen, uh, but I, I haven't thought carefully about that. Um, so that's one possibility. That could happen if you go to the UV. The second possibility that could happen is that somehow the UV physics, the high energy physics, uh, adds back all these fluctuating pieces, that these are somehow complicated new gravitational solutions that are more complicated and full of UV ingredients, and there's many of them. And that if you add all these extra little pieces back, that somehow uh, we get this as the full answer, where this is the semi-classical answer, and these are kind of quantum thingies that one needs to add. And that is the way that factorization gets restored. Uh, and the third possibility is that in the full UV theory, this is absent. And this disagreement remains. And then the, the only possibility that's left in some sense in that case would be that then the UV theory really must be averaged. Because the only way that this equation can be true without this here, is by putting bars over this. Uh, and then this can be true. Um, so those are basically the three logical possibilities that 
of what could happen in the UV. Uh, my best guess right now, but it would be nice to have a better argument for it, is that it will be the first possibility that happens in general rather than the second one. But I don't have a very strong argument. Yes, can I ask you a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, is it like we have a warm hole solution in the IR and there is no warm hole solution in the UB? Is that true? Um, th that would be the first scenario. Yeah, that you have in the IR that you have what appears to be bona fide warm hole solutions, but then in the UV that you could argue they will be destabilized by brain anti brain nucleation, for example. Um, Okay. It's also possible that above a certain energy scale, there is a certain uh, degree of freedom that becomes tachyonic in the wormhole background. That's another uh, mechanism that might happen and that could destabilize the wormhole. Okay. But so, we definitely have examples where brain antibrains destabilize the wormhole, but that would be basically the first scenario. Yeah. So is there any theory where a wormhole solution still exists in the UV? I don't know an example in string theory. So that's now a string theory question. Uh, you can ask whether we know an, one example in string theory where we reliably know the wormhole to be uh, really stable in every possible imaginable way. I don't think we have such a solution right now. There's a paper by uh, Merov and Santos where they list a bunch of wormholes in different dimensions with different ingredients and so on, and they check for various instabilities. I think there are a few for which they did not find an obvious instability, but they did not prove that these things have no instabilities. Um, so, so we have some wormholes that seem to exist in string theory and that um, whose instability has not yet been found, let's put it that way. But it has also not been proven that they do not have an instability. Okay, thank you. So this is a kind of analogy between the phase transition in QCD from confined phase to deconfined phase, where uh, uh, on the gravity dual side, it is interpreted as uh, phase transition from entanglement entropy of connected surface to disconnected surface. This is kind of analogy here. Um, yeah, although that, that, that's a more conventional phase transition, this is somewhat more exotic, where it's almost like you, um, in, in this language, one has a phase transition between something with an apparent correlation to something without an apparent correlation. However, there never is an actual correlation in the theory. But in the confinement, deconfinement phase transition, there, there is an actual proper phase transition with an order parameter and so on. Uh, yes. but, but there is an artifact of some approximation that one is making. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, John, I also have a very uh, clarification question about this first point is that suppose you have some solution which is metastable, uh, almost very, which is very, very well, uh, maybe very metastable, then uh, wouldn't you expect there'll be some contribution to the path integral from here still? Or this is a very yeah, confused question, maybe. Um, I don't think the rules are fully known. Um, So many gravitational solutions, they, the general problem of the Euclidean path integral in any case is, this, uh, is the wrong sign of the conformal factor problem. Uh, so, so if you look at fluctuations around the Euclidean background, then typically the kinetic term for the conformal factor has the wrong sign. And that is why if the Euclidean gravitational path integral seems to be problematic. Uh, the usual way around that is to find a suitable uh, complex contour to integrate along where you sort of go in the imaginary direction for the conformal factor and so on. Um, but we don't, I think, fully know the rules of which contours in complexified metric space we should integrate over. If you have like a, a metastable solution, it might contribute to the path integral, uh, but it can only be thought of as a saddle point if you sort of go in the imaginary direction for the unstable directions. And uh, uh, yeah, then one needs to think hard whether those complexified metrics are okay and we're actually doing the integral along the right contour and we don't really fully know the prescription there. I think there was like some progress by um, Gonshevitz and Siegel who try to write some sort of criterion and written elaborated a bit on that. So, so they wrote some criterion for 
what could be admissible complex metrics. But I think that was a criterion based on matter field fluctuations. And I'm not sure that we, and that seemed a reasonable criterion, but I'm not sure that that is the same criterion for metric fluctuations. So I don't, and to be honest, yeah, I don't think we fully know the rules of complexified uh, metrics and contours and how to choose the contour for the, for the uh, quantum gravity path in the world precisely. Okay, thank you, yeah. If it was just matter stable and there would be a, a um, an okay contour, then um, um, and maybe that would make sense. For example, there are these uh, fairly easy to construct axionic wormholes that um, involve uh, an axion, but these axions are also complex, they're imaginary. They have the wrong sign kinetic term. Uh, so if you allow yourself a wrong sign kinetic term, then uh, you know you can make axionic wormholes. But again, there's a question about uh, instabilities and so on. Uh, more generally, if you want to make a, a wormhole, so a wormhole looks a bit like a space that contracts and then expands again. If you go along the wormhole, right, it shrinks and then expands again. It's very hard to make spaces that shrink and uh, expand again even in Euclidean signature, um, because these tend to violate energy conditions. This is precisely why uh, these uh, crunch bang transitions in cosmology are hard to make without violating energy conditions. It's not dissimilar to why it's hard to make wormholes. Um, uh, and well, one way to violate energy conditions is to flip signs of kinetic terms of fields. And that's why one often in examples of wormholes, one sees examples where some kinetic term it has the wrong sign. And that allows you to sort of make the wormhole. Uh, the other nice way to make a wormhole is to have uh, slices with constant negative curvature, because that is sort of the, uh, the negative curvature of the slices is the thing that violates the energy condition. And that's much uh, less severe than having a wrong sign kinetic term for a field. And that also allows you to stabilize the wormhole. Right. Thanks. 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 Um, so, um, yeah, so my favorite, I, I sometimes show this cartoon of the spectrum of a typical CFT that appears in ADS CFT, where um, on the left axis, we see the energies on the horizontal axis is somehow the coupling constant of the theory. So at weak coupling, the energy is kind of evenly spaced and it's regular and well behaved. And this is, uh, you know, almost integral theory. Um, that as you increase the coupling, the spectrum of, of a CFT arranges itself in a particular way. Namely at low energies, we get a relatively sparse energy spectrum. This is the sector of the CFT that is uh, that is basically given by an integrable system. So one can in principle even compute uh, the spectrum here um, in the leading large n approximation, but exactly as a function of the coupling constant. But at very high energies, there's a lot of evidence that the spectrum of the CFT is chaotic. This is where the black holes live and the transition between the two is roughly uh, the black hole, uh, the threshold for black hole creation. Um, so this is the easy sector of the theory, and this is the difficult sector of the theory. Um, and for example, black holes live here, and they sample a coarse-grained version of the spectrum here. So in some sense, a low energy, low energy semi-classical gravity has access to this sector of the theory. But here, because the level spacing is so dense, it, it must automatically coarse-grain the, the energy spectrum in order to uh, uh, just, you don't just, there's no experiment that you can do at low energies that resolve these individual lines here. The best you can do is find a coarse grained version of that spectrum. A chaotic spectrum, by the way, um, this is one particular chaotic spectrum, but if you coarse grain a chaotic spectrum by binning the energies, then you get something that is very hard to distinguish from an ensemble. For example, um, 
the first time this maybe kind of logic was applied was by Wigner in, in, uh, in nuclear physics, where he tried to explain the spectra of, of nuclei, uh, which were known to be kind of chaotic, uh, in terms of a matrix model. And now, obviously, the spectrum of a nucleus is not some random thing. It is a particular spectrum, but it had all the features as if it came from a matrix model. So that that was a successful phenological description of the spectrum of a nucleus. Uh, and and semi-classical graffiti is very similar. It seems to, uh, although this is a very precise spectrum, there's nothing being averaged over. Um, this spectrum is as if it were drawn, as if it was taken from a probability distribution. And what the low energy theory gives you is properties of that probability distribution, which there is not really a probability distribution, but the, this spectrum is indistinguishable from something drawn from a probability distribution as far as low energy coarse grained observables go. And so the claim is that what is the answer in the boundary theory, the semi-classical low energy gravitational theory, it is the theory of the statistics of the chaotic sector. It does not give you the individual energy levels, but it gives you the statistics of the chaotic sector. That's what gravity does for you. That's literally what it does. Uh, and it can um, probe coarse-grained higher moments the relevant would be statistical distributions, because I was, as I was saying, it looks like these energy levels were sampled from some probability distribution. And you can discover features of that probability distribution, but not the individual values. Um, and in some sense, it cannot really distinguish average from non average theories, as long as the averages. Um, in your average theory, yield the same moments of the statistical distributions as the ones that you can prove with semi-classical graphically. So there's a fundamental limitation on how much information low energy observers can obtain. Uh, you can just get some moments of the statistics of this high energy part of the spectrum, but you can just not see the individual values ever. So that is one way to think about it. Um, let me skip that analogy. Um, now, in order to make a bit more precise what I mean by all these words, I'm going to try to make a bit more precise what I mean by a theory of the statistics of the chaotic sector. That is in line with the question that uh, Ayon was asking earlier. Uh, and this is why I had as my title semi-classical graphy equals statistical physics. Uh, so one nice way to think about statistical physics is that it gives, it gives you the best description of a system with limited information. Um, and the prototypical example is the canonical ensemble. The canonical ensemble can be obtained with this logic as follows. Suppose you want to find the state rho in such a way that the expectation value of the energy, so trace rho h, is equal to some given number e. And we're going to enforce this condition with a Lagrange multiplier, lambda. And then we're going to maximize the entropy of the state. So this is like our ignorance, if you want. Uh, we're going to maximize the entropy of the state given that the energy takes a particular value. Uh, and if you extremize this thing here, so you vary rho a bit and you solve the equation, then you find that rho. Uh, is equal to some number times the exponent of lambda h. Uh, and then, so there's still an unknown parameter lambda here, which is the Lagrange multiplier, and that you need to then self-consistently fix so that the energy has the right value. And we know that uh, in order for that to work, we need to choose lambda equals to minus beta. Uh, so we find that um, if our input is some energy, out comes the canonical ensemble. That's the best description of a, of a quantum mechanical system. If the only thing you know that is the energy of the system, because it's the thing that maximizes the entropy. And this is 
very simple but important uh, uh, way to look at statistical physics. Statistical physics is um, giving you the best possible description of the system. And by best possible, I mean the one with maximal entropy subject to observation or input. In this case, the energy. Um, to give you a slightly more elaborate example of this way of thinking, suppose that you have some system where you know the approximate spectral density of the system, and you also know the approximate finite temperature two-point function of some operator A. So suppose that these are your inputs and you want to then find the best possible description of the model. Well, following the logic that I just described, you can ask, for example, can I find a probability distribution? Because uh, statistical physics is always about density matrices and probability distributions. Can you find a probability distribution on the space of matrix elements of the operator A? by maximizing uh, some entropy subject to some constraints. Now, in this case, we have an infinite number of constraints. So we have a family of Lagrange multipliers, lambda, uh, t, comma, beta, that multiply something that is part of the inputs that we provide, namely our input by assumption was this finite temperature two-point function, this thing here. And we want it to be equal to whatever the thing is that uh, we were provided with. So someone gave us this function f and said, this is the approximate finite temperature two-point function at finite time of a. So this is our input. We want it to be equal to the two-point function of the operator o, a, and we enforce that by Lagrange multipliers. Uh, and then we're going to look for a probability distribution on the space of matrix elements where we maximize the classical entropy, which is given by this thing here. Uh, this is the same as the von Neumann entropy, but it's classical. So usually we call it Shannon information, but it's really the classical version of von Neumann entropy. Um, so now we have a very elaborate thing that we need to optimize. Uh, but if you work out what the answer is, then you find that the, the optimum that you get is a quadratic matrix model for the matrix element. So the probability distribution for AIJ is going to be equal um, to some Gaussian probability distribution with some coefficients CIJ, and the CIJs depend on the, this function F that was my input. Um, so maximizing the entropy subject to some inputs gives a quadratic matrix model. And this quadratic matrix model is precisely ETH, the so-called eigenstate normalization hypothesis. The eigenstate normalization hypothesis is, is a statement um, which roughly states that as far as low energy computations go, the matrix elements of some simple operator O between exact energy eigenstates EI and EJ can be replaced by a diagonal times a smooth function of the average energies plus an off-diagonal fluctuating piece, which contains a smooth function G of the average energy E and the energy difference delta E. There's an entropic factor E minus S E over two. And then there is a random Gaussian variable R that has zero one point function and some diagonal two point function. Um, well, that means that, that as far as ETH goes, this R came from a quadratic matrix model. These are precisely the moments of a quadratic matrix model. So ETH, if we forget about this, di this diagonal term for now, we could just assume the one-point function of O2 vanish, and this thing would simply be absent. Then what ETH says, it says literally that these matrix elements are given by a Gaussian matrix model of some sort. And these coefficients here, they are simply designed to make sure that the, the two-point function comes out okay. And that's literally what I got from this uh, uh, thing before, maximum 
P subject to the input of two point functions at finite temperature. So ETH is not some exotic ansatz. Uh, it is simply statistical physics thinking applied to a finite temperature two point function of a simple operator. And you get ETH out automatically. It's simply, it's ETH is the thing that maximizes the uncertainty of a system. It maximizes the entropy of a system. Sorry, it maximizes the entropy of, the, of a description of the system that is consistent with my low energy observations. So it's a maximal entropy statistical description of my observations. That's what ETH is. That's all that, that ETH is. A maximal entropy statistical description of my low energy information. Where for ETH, the low energy information again was the finite temperature one and two point functions of simple operators. Um, well, this is something I just said. Incidentally, these finite temperature one and two point functions of simple operators are also things that are, are available in semi classical gravity. Uh, so, semi classical gravity. When you apply statistical physics thinking and the maximal entropy principle to uh, ADS CFT computations, you would also be led into ETH. It's just, uh, as I said before, uh, a consequence of applying statistical physics principles to simple finite temperature correlators. And a, a fun third example is that suppose that this is in, in some sense much simpler than the previous one. Suppose that you compute the black hole partition function as a function of temperature. And that's all that you have. You have some Z of beta, some approximate Z of beta. Then you can ask, you know, can I make a statistical model of the theory that has maximal entropy, but is consistent with my Z of beta? And so what do you do? Well, um, you write, a statistical model of the Hamiltonian of the theory, you introduce Lagrange multipliers in such a way that the partition function is equal to Z of beta, because that's my, that these are my observations, that's my input. So I want all my Z of betas to come out correctly. For that, I introduce Lagrange multipliers. And then I um, look for a probability distribution on the space of Hamiltonians with this Shannon, uh, with this von Neumann entropy or Shannon information uh, kind of thing, quantifying my uncertainty, quantifying my entropy. Um, and this is the functional you need to maximize. So you maximize this entropy subject to these Lagrange multipliers. And it's very easy to, to optimize for mu of h, and you find that the probability distribution on the space of Hamiltonians that's compatible with these inputs is simply given by this expression here. It's an integral over d beta times these Lagrange multipliers times trace e minus beta h. Um, now, these lambda betas can be anything. You just need to fix them so that the partition function comes out OK. But a different way to do this, you, you can basically write any single trace uh, potential or any single trace function of H in this form. This is like a, a, a Laplace transform of lambda that gives you V, or Legendre transform, sorry, of lambda that gives you V. So you can might as well conclude that uh, the probability distribution on the space of Hamiltonians is given by X minus trace some function of a. So this is this is a matrix model, a single trace matrix model. And this potential V, it's it's determined by Z of beta. Because you have to check that these expectation values are equal to Z of beta. Um, 
But given C of beta, there's going to be some V of H that can be computed with some uh, integral transform. And that V of H is the matrix model. And that's the best description uh, of your system if the only thing that you know is the partition function as a function of temperature. You get a statistical description. So the statistical description that you get, the claim is not that your theory is statistical. There might as well just be one Hamiltonian. For all you know, there's just a single Hamiltonian. But the only thing that you know is approximate partition functions. And if the only thing you know is approximate partition functions, then your best model as an observer of reality that you can build is a statistical model of reality. And the statistical model in this case is the matrix model for the Hamiltonian. That's the maximal entropy model in the spirit of the canonical ensemble. It's a statistical model. It's the best possible model you can build of reality given your very limited knowledge of reality. Uh, Jan, I have a question here. So this uh, discussion is, uh, is is little uh, uh, kind of very general, but uh, but in in string theory you can think of like pairing the coupling, and uh, I think there was this uh, discussion about uh, what are the wormhole like solutions. We had a talk by Yang Min Chen and all this that survive even when you have uh, when you crank up the coupling, go away from strong coupling. Uh, so there also you see the slope ramp plateau, like at least a slope and ramp or something there, where there are some analogs of that people understand. And so do you have some comment on that, like how you can refine this discussion further, like you to include, uh, like not going at infinite coupling, but also say, yes. Yeah, 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 well, the, what I said on the last few slides had nothing to do with weak coupling or strong coupling or chaos or anything. And the only and you can make it as general as you want. The general, the general thing is that uh, you collect all information that you have available, and then you try to, to build a maximal entropy description that is compatible with the information that you have available. If you're if you have a weak, if your if your input was that of a weakly coupled theory, um, Presumably, this V of H would be very narrowly peaked around the precise exact H. It would just be very narrowly peaked. So the width of this trace of V of H may well depend on the coupling constant of the theory. I would imagine that as the theory becomes more chaotic, this, this V of H is a bit broader. Um, because you do more coarse graining as you go from high to low energies, if your theory is very chaotic, because you sample like the energy spacing in a typical chaotic theory is E minus S. You have to coarse grain over like bins of those energies. And there's lots of energies that you coarse grain over. Uh, and that is something that this V of H kind of knows about. So in, so in some sense, I would imagine this V of H to be a bit broader in a strongly coupled theory and a bit narrower in a weakly coupled theory. But it would be uh, the reason. So yeah, I see. So, is there any model where you can put the coupling inside and, like, and I mean, some some notion of coupling in, into this calculation and see this uh, change in P of H or? Uh, um, yeah, that would be interesting. I don't have an immediate model because. Uh, let's see. Well, ideally, we would take a model that that interpolates between uh, uh, a weakly coupled and a strongly coupled theory. Where Z of beta also actually depends on that coupling in some interesting way. Um, but I think those are quite, I, I'm not sure we have models where we actually know Z of beta as a function of the coupling and as a function of beta uh, explicitly. Except maybe in 2D CFTs, but those are a bit anomalous because Z of beta is universal at high temperature, whether the theory is weakly or strongly coupled. Well, mm -hmm. you to think a little bit whether a how a so 
in a 2D CFT, for example, we know that in a strongly coupled theory, the Cardi formula remains an excellent approximation all the way to the black hole threshold, whereas in a weakly coupled theory, it is not nearly an, uh, as good an approximation up to the black hole threshold. It starts to deviate from the Cardi answer when you approach uh, C over 12. Um, so maybe one could write something that interpolates, say, between an exact free boson answer uh, and something that's Cardi all the way to the black hole threshold. And see how that reflects on the potential to get like a first guess. Hmm. Um, but it clearly is something one can explore because this is just, this is purely a, a recipe level prescription. Whatever you give me, I stick into this machine and something comes out. Okay. Um, Thanks. But what I, I yeah, this 2D example might be the simplest one to explore a bit. And then I would expect this V of H to, uh, yeah, to be a bit broad. Certainly in the regime where you have the black hole threshold, I would expect it to be a bit broader in the strongly coupled case as compared to the weakly coupled case. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have this this Z of beta here. Uh, we get some matrix model. Um, be, but now because it's a statistical description, this statistical description has correlations in it, which is just due to the fact that it's a statistical description of the theory. Uh, and in the complete absence of any other information, you can now that that's an accident of these single trace matrix models. You can actually compute. Uh, the connected two-point function, which is this thing here. Uh, and you get an answer that is universal, doesn't depend on any details of the theory. Um, you get a prediction for the connected two-point function of two partition functions. And the reason that you get a non-trivial number here is, is, is your ignorance, your lack of knowledge of the UV of the theory. Because you don't have, you don't know exactly what the theory in the UV is. The best thing you can do is to make a statistical model of the UV of the theory with maximal entropy. That is just what statistical physics tells you to do. And once you have that statistical model, you can now compute connected correlators between more than one partition function. And there will be such a connected correlator. Uh, and this connected correlator is just a measure of the correlations in your statistical model. And you can, for example, uh, in JT gravity, this equation uh, holds precisely in this way. And you can also compare these uh, uh, connected correlators, for example, in uh, three dimensions. Uh, Kotler and Jensen looked into that, and you again get something that looks exactly like this, if you look at the simplest possible uh, connected wormholes in three dimensions. Although there you have to uh, add a few ingredients to extract uh, a number. Um, you can see how to get something like this out of such a computation. So it seems to suggest that what these wormholes are actually measuring, what they're computing for you, is the statistical correlations in your statistical description of the model. They just confirm to you that you had the right statistical description. Gravity simply does not have more information than whatever is in the statistical description. That's the best gravity can do. If you wanted to do better, you have to add uh, you know, more matter fields to gravity or non perturbative physics or some other stringy ingredients, and then you would get a different description. But as long as you stay within a given low energy approximation, the result is inevitably a statistical description. That statistical description has wormhole solutions in it, and uh, those are precisely the wormholes that gravity knows about. Um, okay. Now, 
Um, I'm thinking about the time. So let me um, not take an infinite amount of time here and uh, uh, skip a few things here and there because I just wanted to get mostly this conceptual message across. Um, so let me speed up slightly and just mention that this game, this, this is just a general game. I give you some input and out comes a statistical model. Um, and in general, the structure is always that you uh, have some observables A. So these are, and your input observations are some functions of these observables, could be correlation functions, partition functions, whatever, just some stuff. Uh, Semi-classical gravity gives an approximate answer CI for those numbers, for those correlation functions, for those partition functions. We enforce all of our observations using Lagrange multipliers. And then we build the best possible statistical model by maximizing some entropy functional. And then the structure of the probability distribution, so this is maybe an important equation. The structure of the probability distribution is always e to the minus a linear combination of your input observables. So if you input things that are quadratic in your observables, you get a quadratic matrix model out. If you input things that are quartic in your observables, you get a fourth order matrix model like thing out, etc. That's the general structure of your statistical description. Um, the same philosophy can be applied to the operator product coefficients in the chaotic CFT. Um, you cannot directly compute OPEs in a chaotic theory. You can compute them maybe for simple light operators. Uh, but if you have operators that are so heavy that they live in the chaotic sector of the theory, so their conformal dimension is above the black hole threshold, um, then uh, you can no longer compute them directly. Uh, and therefore, but you can still extract information about those objects. So the OPE coefficients of a two-dimensional are, say, any, any uh, CFT typically depend on light and on heavy operators, depending on whether or not you're in the black hole sector of the theory. Um, and semi-classical gravity has access to the statistics of these OPE coefficients with one, two, or three heavy index. So schematically, if you compute uh, a four-point correlator of light operators in the theory, like here, light, 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 light. This is just a standard uh, representation of the four-point correlator in conformal field theory. This is equal to uh, the square of OPE coefficients, but you sum over intermediate channel age. You cannot put a heavy operator on an external line because for that you would need to have to uh, have access to an exact black hole microstate. That's not something you have available uh, in the low energy gravitational theory. You don't know what the exact black hole microstates are, but you do have access to light operators. So in AGS CFT, we could compute the correlator of four light operators in the right kinematical regime, and we would be reproducing this sum. Similarly, a genus a one point function, uh, sorry, a two point function, two point at high temperature is equal to a sum over OPE coefficient squared, where you sum over that heavy line and this heavy line. Uh, and then if you do these types of diagrams, which in the 2D CFT would correspond to a genus two computation, you can sort of see a genus two diagram here. Um, then you have to sum over three heavy indices. Uh, so these things are all things that can be approximately computed in the semi-classical gravitational theory. You can then go on and build a statistical model for these quantities. And the statistical model that you will get for these quantities will be a quadratic matrix model by construction, because as I explained to you in general, if your input is quadratic stuff, out comes a quadratic matrix model. So the output of all of this will be a quadratic matrix model. 
And you can rephrase that in the language of ETH, which is also essentially a quadratic matrix model. That's what Alex Bellin and I call the OPE randomness hypothesis. It's just a generalization of ETH to OPE coefficients, where in all cases, uh, we have some uh, slowly varying function of arguments that multiplies the random matrix or a random vector, a random matrix or a random tensor. And these are all part of a quadratic random factor, random matrix or random tensor model, just by construction. Now, um, I'm going to skip how you compute all of this. Um, all, all of these diagrams, typically you can compute using CFT techniques, uh, using things like crossing symmetry, uh, and in two dimensions, you have more sophisticated technology that use the crossing kernel and the fusion kernel and so on. Um, I'm not going to explain that, uh, but there are ways to compute what these things are in a CFT in many cases. And you can use that to figure out what these explicit functions F have to be. So there is a concrete proposal for a 2D, uh, for any CFT, basically what, what these things roughly look like. Um, and that's an extension of the eigenstate randomization hypothesis to the OPE coefficients of a 2D CFT. Uh, and it's called the OPE randomness hypothesis. Now, skip, skip, skip. Skip, skip. So these are all computations. You can do many computations. You can also compute higher order correlators, but I'm going to skip all of that. Um, make that too. Yep. Now, so you can use all your low energy information, uh, correlation functions of light operators in a theory, uh, genus one, genus two, finite temperature, et cetera. All your information can be. Uh, input in a generating functional Z of OPE coefficients J of J's in such a way that correlation functions, because we're making a statistical model, statistical models have correlation functions. And these correlation functions look like some correlator of a bunch of C's is equal to this generating functional. You differentiate it with respect to the sources and then you put J equals zero. So this is the general structure that you get if you try to model a very large number of low energy computations in the gravitational theory uh, in terms of a statistical model. This is the result of that computation. You get some elaborate statistical model. It has a generating functional for correlation functions of the Cs, of the OPE coefficients. Uh, and that's the best possible description of the theory based on all this gravitational input. Um, there are two interesting questions about this construction. One is what types of index contractions appear? Uh, it, it appears that the only index contractions that ever appear are where the same index appears only twice. So for example, you never seem to get something like JAAB, JAAB, where you sum over A and B. That's not something that ever seems to emerge from any gravitational computation. Um, and what's also interesting uh, is- What does the index A, B, C, what do they run over? Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, so these, um, all these indices here are heavy indices. Okay. So they, okay. they run over basis of the, sorry. Yeah, they run over basis of the operators of the theory. Because these computations here, um, sorry, uh, these computations here, they always involve a sum, sums over uh, these heavy indices. And that's why in these matrix models, uh, you always get a sum over heavy indices. So these labels, sorry, I should maybe just have called them H and H prime and so on. They precisely represent these heavy indices. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, I should have said that. 
and what computation you can do in gravity to compute this correlation functions of Cs? Well, for example, um, well, maybe I'll quickly go back. So this is the CFT, this diagram on the left is the CFT computation that corresponds to the thing on the right. Um, now, if you want this thing to be heavy, then you want to be in a regime where the distance between those two points is long, because if they get very close, the identity channel dominates in this intermediate channel. But as it gets longer and longer, um, heavy fields start to dominate. So you have to be in a particular kinematic regime of the four point function, where the cross ratio of the four external points is such that this thing becomes very long and heavy operators dominate. Um, but from the from an from a gravitational point of view, this computation is simply a computation where you take, uh, say, the theory on a sphere and you put four light operators on the boundary, and you just compute a few low lying Witten diagrams. In 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 gravity, by the way, um, you just compute some low lying uh, Witten diagrams with the light fields only. In the bulk, you never see these heavy fields. This would be like black hole physics. But in the bulk, there's always a way to do the computation with written diagrams that only involves light fields. And that is the, that's the gravitational computation. That even holds in the case where on the boundary, it's heavy fields that dominate. Because if, if on the boundary heavy fields dominate, then you know that there is also a dual computation by crossing symmetry where light fields dominate. And gravity will automatically select that computation for you. Um, the second one, uh, so, so this has to be at relatively high temperature, these, this torus. This is a two-point function on the torus at high temperature. But, you know, it's no big deal in AGS-CFT. You, uh, you take a torus at high temperature, you fill up the torus, as Euclidean ADC tells you to do, that's just a regular solid torus. You put two operators on the boundary and you compute the, 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 the propagator between the two points in this torus geometry. Um, this one is slightly more complicated, but this one would be the case where you take, say, a genus two boundary renal surface and you just fill it up with a smooth geometry and you compute the partition function of that geometry, like a handle body geometry in ADC of T. I'm not saying that that's entirely straightforward, but there is technology to do that, and uh, it can be done, and that, that's, uh, that's a computation you could do in gravity. So the, uh, uh, and many of these, like these, this genus two one in higher dimensions is less clear, but these other two things can simply be done in higher dimensions. You take a higher dimensional sphere for light operators, you take S1 times S to the D minus one, and you put two operators on it, and you compute the propagator. And yeah. Are these explicit computations uh, in ADS3 CFT2, or is it also possible to do this in high dimensions? Um, <coughs> well, ADS3 CFT2, these computations uh, can be done in higher dimensions. Um, I'm pretty sure this four point function can be done because that just requires essentially uh, two leading or just two propagators in the right channel. And that's pretty, that's quite straightforward. Uh, so the four point function can be done, I think, in any dimension. Um, whether one can analytically uh, do the finite temperature two point function in higher dimensions, I don't know. Maybe one has to do numerics because that requires one to take a Euclidean cigar geometry in higher dimensions and compute a propagator for a massive scalar, say. Right. And I, I am not entirely sure whether that can be done analytically. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. But certainly it can be uh, you know, numerically approximated, so yeah. Um, and yeah, it can 
it's in principle information that's available to the semi-classical gravitational theory, whether one can then explicitly compute it by hand or not. I know that it's, it's available information. And so one can make this generating functional. And this is then our best possible description of the theory. Now, a very interesting question is the following. Suppose I do ADS-CFT with one boundary. And I do many, many computations with this one boundary only. I built a corresponding statistical description of the theory using the algorithm I explained. So I take one-sided information only. I compute correlators. I built a matrix model-like thing, a statistical representation of the theory based on my one-sided information. That statistical object will, in principle, have correlations in it between multiple boundaries. So if your input is only single boundary information, you get a statistical model. That statistical model also has, gives a prediction for what happens if you have more than one boundary. Just like in this uh, simple matrix model case, I, my input was one was just a single partition function as a function of temperature, and out came a prediction for the connected two-point correlator of Z beta one, Z beta two. So much more generally, I can do my standard one-sided ADS-CFT computations, build a statistical model. That statistical model has correlations in it that are you know, due to your lack of knowledge of the UV of the theory. And that is encoded uh, in the fact that this statistical description also has connected higher point correlators. So you get wormhole predictions from one-sided co computations. And then you can check uh, whether the predictions agree with a gravitational computation. So I get a prediction for a wormhole. And then you can check whether that agrees with my gravitational computation, which would tell you that you need no further refinements of the matrix model. Or maybe the predictions do not agree with the gravitational computations. And then you have new information coming from your gravitational computation. And you should further refine the matrix model. In essence, you would need to add double trace type terms to your matrix model. Right now, it appears, although um, the verdict is still out that the first statement is true, which, which is interesting because it seems to tell us that, that what these wormhole solutions are telling us is nothing new. They are just telling us that we have built the right statistical description of the theory based on gravitational information. And those wormholes are simply agreeing with the statistical model that I built. So they simply they they simply uh, say uh, they simply confirm the validity of my statistical description rather than giving new information. They're just a confirmation that as far as low energy physics goes, the best possible description is indeed the matrix model. It's just the best possible description based on statistical physics. So that's kind of remarkable. So that tells you that um, you know these wormholes, even if they're there, they're fine, but there isn't really any new information in them. They're just telling you that uh, your one-sided statistical model that you built is the right description of the theory. And is, if you wish, the answer to the question, what is the boundary dual description of low energy semi-classical gravity? Well, it's a particular statistical model of the UV. And that statistical model includes automatically, you don't have to put it in by hand, it includes knowledge of all these wormholes. And you can find evidence for this statement. For example, uh, this is just a simple example. This was the one uh, I originally studied with uh, Alex Bellin a few years ago. 
is, for example, suppose that we make a statistical model for our theory, and it is a quadratic matrix model for, for these OPE coefficients. That's my statistical model. Now I can ask in my statistical model, uh, and to get the quadratic matrix model for heavy, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients, I needed to do a genus two computation. Now you can add the question, what about the product of two genus two partition functions? So in terms of heavy, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients, the product of two genus two partition functions looks like this. And that's the product of two genus two partition functions. Uh, and now since you have a quadratic matrix model, we can just use a sort of free field Feynman diagram logic to compute this uh, four point correlator. Uh, and there are two possible wick contractions between the C's. The first one is in the first line here. Uh, you either contract one and two and three and four. Uh, that's just the disconnected computations, as, as you see by inspection. And that indeed in gravity corresponds to the product of two genus two handle bodies. There's no wormhole. Uh, there's just two separate ADS solutions. And this is just the product of those. Um, but then, there is another contraction you can take, which connects these different solutions together. There's another WIC contraction that exists. If you compute that, you can do that computation using the quadratic matrix model, well, tensor model in this case, that you build for the Cs. Uh, you get a, a prediction for a connected contribution. And there also exists a connected wormhole that was uh, found by Maldacena and Maos in 2004. It's very simple just two genus two boundaries of a throat in between. Uh, and you can check that, the, that this two, these two computations are in fact the same. So this is an example where the genus two wormhole does not give you any new information. If my input is one-sided information, that one-sided information gives rise to a quadratic matrix model, I can then use that quadratic matrix model to compute a connected correlator between two genus two partition functions. And the result of that happens to be precisely the same as that of the genus two wormhole. So, so this genus two wormhole in some sense had to work out okay. Uh, there's no new information. It's just part of the statistical description of the theory. Now this story can be continued. Um, you can find new predictions. So we're currently investigating several new predictions. There's also some surprises, but let me not talk about that. Um, I should mention that um, there's a much more elaborate test of this idea, essentially in a paper by uh, Chandra, Collier, Hartman, and Maloney. Um, they, they do this computation ADS3, CFT2. They, they postulate cardi density of states. And again, essentially a quadratic matrix model for many of the OPE coefficients. Uh, and they, they show by various techniques that this reproduces many gravitational computations. The perspective is different, but uh, all their computations are 100% in agreement with what I just said, namely one-sided information is enough. You build a statistical model. That statistical model predicts all the wormholes for you. There's no, no new information whatsoever in any wormhole solution. And uh, that I skip to. Yeah. Now, um, this whole course, basically this statistical model, it, it's not fundamental here. This statistical model that we make is not fundamental. It is just a result of you being an imperfect observer. You cannot measure everything and you cannot measure things infinitely accurately. You just cannot. Um, however, there's a subtle difference between this statistical model and if your theory was fundamentally averaged. Um, because if you, if you make a statistical model,
then as you add more information, so you keep on increasing the scale and you add more and more operators and more and more input. As you keep on adding more and more information, um, the model um, becomes more and more accurate. And in the limit that you add infinite amounts of information, the model is no longer statistical. You, you just land on the individual theory that you're, you know, the exact UV theory. Where is, if you have an average of theories, then as you, so averaging always comes with some scale, which is roughly the scale of something that you average over. That scale uh, means that, uh, that um, as you add more information, your model improves. But once you add information above the averaging scale, then the model no longer becomes more accurate. The, the variances in answer re remain the same because now uh, you can add as much information as you want, but your, your theory is fundamentally an average, which means that all variances in all quantities and all disconnected correlators are fundamentally non-zero. And you can add as much information as you want. You will not get rid of this phenomenon. Uh, so this model does not become more accurate. And that is the, that's the conceptual difference between building a statistical model based on incomplete information uh, versus doing some averaging at fundamental level. In one case, as you go to the UV, you will see that the thing approaches a fixed theory. In the other case, you will improve the theory, but then in some, at some point you stay in this average. But before you hit the averaging scale, you cannot really distinguish the two phenomena. You have to basically add enough information to go above the scale of averaging to see a distinction between this uh, sort of building the statistical model in, in a single theory versus this fundamentally average theory. Sorry, but, but in the JT gravity example you started with, it's one, it, it, there I thought it was the averaging interpretation that people favored. That is the one that's averaged because yes. that's an example of, uh, that's, a somewhat misleading example where the dual theory is really averaged. So if you build, you could play the same uh, game there, but then your statistical model at some point would stop becoming more accurate. And you would see in this approach that you're in an average and not in a statistical model. Uh, but in higher dimensional ADS CFT cases where we believe there exists a single CFT that is dual to ADS, right. we in the first case. So what, what is the competition that one would do in JT gravity to see that we were in this average uh, um, well, situation? Yeah. What you can do in JT um, is you can show uh, non-perturbatively that the full partition function of the theory is given by a matrix model that has a finite variance. Uh -huh. And if the theory was a single, so for example, the variance in the partition function remains finite. All right. Whereas the variance in the partition function in, in, uh, in an exact theory should go to zero as you increase the scale of the, th of the system. But in JT, the variance in the partition function remains finite non-perturbatively. Okay. Therefore, it's an average theory and, and not a single theory. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Okay. So uh, this is statement about the duality between matrix model uh, and war model. Is this the, true for any specific dimension? Uh, for example, JT, uh, SYK, or is it for any general D dimension? I think the fact that, um, I think, if you have a topological gravitational theory, a theory of topological gravity, 
that is UV complete, it may well be dual to an average. Um, but if you uh, have any known ADS CFT example, where we think the CFT, uh, th those are always cases where the gravitational theory is not topological. Uh, in those cases, I think there's no reason to a priori expect an average. Okay. So suppose, for example, uh, if we have n boundary wormhole, then what will be the dual description? It, it will be again a matrix model or something else. In which case, in JT? Uh, like n boundary wormhole. Here, yeah, you have some four point connected function. So, for example, in that, well, case, if you, uh, I guess, uh, wormhole. Yeah, yeah. Well, for example, um, um, for example, um, if you had some wormhole with, uh, say, three genus two boundaries, suppose you would have a wormhole that looks like this. Okay. Um, we so this this thing here is given by uh, by basically two OPE coefficients with some extra factors around it. This thing is given by two OPE coefficients with some extra factors around it. And this one too, this model can easily accommodate this kind of structure because you know if you have a quadratic matrix model and you compute a correlator of six Cs, there's a wick contraction that connects this one to that one, that one to that one, and that one to that one. That's a fully connected uh, three boundary correlator. Uh, and, and the matrix model still gives non-trivial uh, expectations for these types of multi-boundary wormholes. Okay, so uh, if you, we want to understand this geometry from the gravity perspective, so uh, I guess it is like uh, if we have a d-dimensional uh, CFT, uh, which are three boundaries over here, then uh, common direction is like d minus one dimension. Is this true? Um, sorry, what, not sure I understood okay. the question. So the boundary here is just two-dimensional. The bulk is three-dimensional. You would have to find a Euclidean uh, a wormhole in three dimensions with two with three genus two boundaries. Okay, what are the common directions between these two, three boundaries? The common directions? Yes. Uh, you mean how the topology works? Yes. Yeah, that, uh, that I don't know. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah. I don't know exactly how to, I think there are general uh, ways to construct wormholes of these types because many of these handle body type things and more general things we uh, studied using uniformization theory and Shelby groups and, and things like that. So I, I think there have been papers that studied more general wormholes with multiple torus boundaries, etc. But I don't know exactly uh, how the topology of this example would work out. It would be interesting to try to do this computation. Uh -huh. uh, but it will be sort of doubly exponentially down compared to the leading wormhole. And uh, so it's, yeah, it might be hard to find, but this would roughly be the idea. Okay. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, another thing that you can do, that's, a, that's an interesting question, and we are trying to... Uh, 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 look look into that, and hopefully this will appear soon. Is to simply take semi-classical gravity as a standalone theory. Don't worry too much whether it's UV complete or not. You can make a statistical model of it in the way that I just described. Uh, and maybe that statistical model, if if that statistical model really knows everything there is to know about the semi-classical gravitational theory, and that's kind of how it was constructed. It, it is apparently some sort of matrix slash tensor model for this gravitational theory. Um, and if you do that for pure 3D gravity, so there is a long discussion and a long story, you know, what is the dual of 3D gravity and so on. Uh, there's, it's still unclear whether it's a well-posed question. Um, but if you just input as much low energy 3D information as possible, you do get some sort of interesting model which is a combination of a matrix and a tensor model, and it has quadratic and quartic vertices. Uh, but that seems to capture almost any computation that you may want to do in three-dimensional gravity. 
Uh, so you might speculate that this mixed matrix tensor model is somehow uh, a combinatorial representation of 3D geometry. Uh, we have combinatorial representations of 2D geometry through the matrix models of several decades ago, uh, using triangulation services and so on, but I don't think we have a combinatorial representation of three-dimensional geometries. Uh, maybe there have been attempts using tetrahedra, yeah, these, uh, what's it called, these two RIF models and so on, uh, but I don't think this is a really reliable combinatorial representation, so this would be a candidate combinatorial representation of 3D geometry, and we're very interested to see if one can directly see the 3D geometry emerge from this kind of uh, matrix slash tensor model, but that is uh, remains to be seen. Um, and this I will unfortunately uh, skip. And this is also something I already told you that I suspect that if you want to uh, restore factorization, that my guess is that all these wormholes are unstable. But it remains a very interesting open question. What the minimum number of ingredients are that you need to add to the semi-classical theory uh, to restore factorization? And there's uh, all kinds of interesting suggestions in the literature, half wormholes, brains, non-local interactions, whatever. Uh, but it's unclear uh, which of these is correct. You might hope that this universal question has a, a universal answer. And it's not very model dependent. And in one case, it's a half wormhole, and blah, blah. Uh, but, but it's unclear. And it might be that simply all these wormholes get destabilized, which would be a very simple universal thing to happen. Uh, but this, this, I think, remains an important open question. Um, yes, sorry for going over time considerably. And in any case, I hope to have convinced you somewhat that semi-classical gravity is a theory that is statistical physics. And it's the statistical physics theory of the high energy sector of the theory. Uh, as far as we know, um, uh, it's consistent with wormhole solutions and it predicts wormhole solutions. And so far, um, yeah, the whole, the whole framework seems to be self-consistent. It is tempting to think that uh, by adding bootstrap approaches and bootstrap information, we might be able to do even better. Um, it's also interesting whether this chaotic random matrix theory nature of the high energy sector can really be proven. In other words, can we prove random matrix universality of strongly coupled CFTs? It, it seems very plausible, but is there a way to, to make that even more plausible or even prove that somehow? And you know what would be proving that? Uh, we don't know. Um, Maybe what we're doing here seems to not rely on gravity all that much. It seems to mostly rely on general principles of statistical physics. So maybe there's some interesting other deep lessons for chaotic systems in, uh, in nature. Um, and another lesson for me personally is that it apparently is incredibly difficult to come up with an interesting low energy observable that probes interesting aspects of quantum gravity. There is always this hope that um, there is an interesting observable in the universe that is sensitive to quantum gravity and so on. Uh, but this entire program and the way we thought about everything seems to suggest almost the opposite, namely that gravity is the theory that has been optimized to make its quantum features as hidden from mankind as humanly possible. Uh, so it's like the most annoying theory as far as measuring quantum physics goes. Um, and it seems to really be, in some sense, it is on the edge of allowed theories, precisely on the edge beyond which it would no longer be consistent, but also on the edge in terms of being difficult to see as quantum features. Like gravity likes to hide all its quantum features in very delocalized, complicated stuff and not in a few simple observables. Um, well, if that's true, then uh, so be it. Um, as I mentioned, it's a great question. What the fundamental principle is that restores factorization? Is it always uh, destabilizing the wormhole or something else? And finally, as I mentioned, um, as long as you're below the averaging scale, if there is any such scale, uh, then basically uh, the theory is agnostic to whether or not you have averaged. 
the results are the same, the description is statistical. And with that, I'd like to stop. Thank you so much for attention. Thanks, Jan, for this great talk. And uh, it was just a pleasure to hear it. And uh, because I think we had many questions, maybe we can have uh, short questions to end it. Uh, if there are some other short questions, and then we can carry over informally, maybe. Okay, so maybe we can close it formally and maybe continue five minutes or so informally. So thanks, Jan, for this great talk again.